can see the live chat there. Please feel free to post questions. Uh, we'll ask Natasha to pause periodically for questions and, and then Chris McKay will moderate those. And then also um, you can send an email to inquiries at historysymposium.com. So Natasha is a, an educator, historian, and a curriculum consultant. She is the president of the Ontario Black History Society. Natasha is currently completing a PhD in history at York University, researching the enslavement of African people in early Ontario. Through various professional, academic, and community roles, Natasha's work is grounded in her commitment to research, collect, preserve, and disseminate the histories of Black Canadians. So please join me in welcoming Natasha Henry. Natasha? Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. And um, thank you for uh, Tom, Chris, for being here to support with uh, moderating the chat. Uh, today, I'm going to be sharing some of my dissertation research on um, the men, women, and children who were enslaved in, uh, in what we now call Ontario. And the title of my talk is Hidden in Plain View, Rereading Colonial Markers in Search of the Enslaved. So as I said, I will talk about uh, my research uh, and in looking at um, our landscape, our contemporary landscape is shaped by settler colonialism. And that's captured by the common markers of settler colonialism, such as heritage plaques, monuments, and town and street names. By the very nature of um, settler colonialism, the black historical subject is often erased or marginalized in the production of history. I refer to uh, Michelle Rolf Trujillo's Silencing the Past to highlight how the silences of the history of enslavement are formed in different stages in the process of the production of history, particularly in the formation of public memory. And an important part of that is the role of power, who has the, the power and the resources to share, to, to construct history and representations of the past. I offer a centering of the lives and experiences of the enslaved through a re-examination of the colonial landscape. I also query what it means to have to enter the colonial archives and landscape to retrieve these stories. Um, and I propose the need for memorials to the enslaved in efforts to reckon with our slave past here in Ontario and in Canada. So with the, you know, the, some of the context of the colonial beginnings of um, settlement of Ontario is rooted in uh, largely in a loyalist history. And the loyalist historical tradition um, came about at a time where they were celebrating the, you know, the, the, the centennial of uh, the American Revolution. And this brought an into um, the profession of history and into our public history. Uh, and to celebrate the British loyalist past and the beginnings of Canada. Uh, and so that's an important uh, lens to apply to uh, my talk today. So I'm going to share with you a few of these markers and then, as I said, provide a rereading to better understand uh, just some of the uh, black men, women and children who were enslaved here in, in early Ontario. So these are um, markers that honor John Butler, who Colonel John Butler, and uh, we see here a plaque uh, uh, that's in Niagara on the Lake, as well as the, the one in the middle, and then the the bust is uh, is represented in in Ottawa. Uh, John Butler and his wife Catherine Bant lived in Niagara on the Lake. And, um, and so it, with these markers, we do not see um, a, a recognition or an identification of the, the Black individuals that they enslaved. And I do want to point out as well that his elder son, Thomas, uh, John and his son, Thomas, enslaved Black people 
in New York and in Ontario. And in fact, Thomas is noted as being uh, as traded in enslaved people. John was the head of Butler's Rangers and captain in, and captain in the Indian Department. He enslaved at least four blacks in Newark, which is now Niagara on the Lake, where he settled. That included a man named Dick, whose name was Richard, a woman named Pat, a girl named Jane, and a boy named George. John bequeathed three of them to his children and grandchildren in his 1796 will. In 1796, Butler also petitioned. Uh, in a petition, he acknowledged that he had previously enslaved three men, Richard Stout, Martin Stout, who we will know as Richard Martin and Peter Martin, and a man by the name of Jack Baker. And Butler attempted to claim the land grants that, were, that they were entitled to for their military service for himself. Um, however, he was unsuccessful. His son, Thomas Butler, as I mentioned, um, is noted to, as his role as a merchant, so he's noted to have uh, participated in the trade and sale of enslaved Africans. He served in the military with his father, and in settling in Niagara on the lake, he was part of the firm Street and Butler. And in 1786, they sold to Adam Chrysler, a young girl by the name of Sarah, nine years old, for 40 pounds. And in another instance in 1793, Thomas placed a runaway advertisement for the man named John that he enslaved in the Upper Canada Gazette, which was at that time the official newspaper of the province. So, who was Peter Martin? I want to get back to him. If we understand uh, a little bit about how John Butler is recognized and his family as uh, one of the, the earlier um, colonial families in Niagara on the Lake, one of the gentlemen that he formerly enslaved was Peter Martin. And so who was Peter Martin? Peter Martin was a black loyalist having served in Butler's Rangers. He received land in Niagara for his military service during the American Revolution, and he received his freedom as well. His relationship with John Butler was still mired in enslavement because his young son, George, mentioned here in the will, along with his three-year-old daughter, Jane, also named here in the will, remained held as slave property of the Butler family. Peter petitioned the Lieutenant Governor for the land grant that was owed to his deceased brother, Richard, for his military service. His reason was particularly poignant. He wanted to sell the land to raise money to buy the freedom of his enslaved children from Colonel, Butler, Colonel Butler's son, Thomas, because John Butler was since deceased. It appears that they agreed for the sum of 60 pounds as the price of George's liberty. It is not clear to my research yet um, what happened to Jane. So in 1797, Peter bought his son's freedom from Thomas Butler. And 15 years later, George Martin is enlisted in the Colored Corps and fought in the War of 1812. That same year, Peter relocated to the town of York, which is now Toronto. Peter's story is also important because he played an important, another important role in the history of enslavement. It was Peter Martin who reported what happened to Chloe Cooley in, seven, in March of 1793. We know about Chloe Cooley today because on that day when she cried a piercing scream when she was being sold across into the United States, across the Niagara River, Peter Martin alerted the executive council as to what was transpiring. And so we see here in um, a transcribed uh, snippet of the minutes of the executive council. It says Peter Martin, a Negro in the service of Colonel Butler attended the board for the purpose of informing them of the violent outrage committed by one Furman who is Vrooman and 
an inhabitant of this province who was living in Queenston. And just so he brings the, this to the attention of, um, of the executive council. And I will get back to the, the importance of this as well, but the attorney general, John White and Lieutenant Governor uh, John Graves Simcoe, they use this, um, this incident to introduce legislation in an attempt to abolish slavery. And so here is one story that uh, we don't often see. Again, when we look at some of the markers of, um, of early settlers, and then we can reread them through the experiences of the individuals that they enslaved, that it provides a different perspective. A second example uh, of some of the markers, the colonial markers um, that I will reread is that of uh, the town sign and the highway sign that um, are named after the Wallbridge family. Um, in you know, historical records and in media coverage, the Wallbridges are noted as very early settlers, uh, influential settlers in, um, in, the, in uh, the Belleville area. And so I wanted to share a little bit of, uh, again, a rereading of where they were. William Holloway Walbridge and his wife, Mary Everett in Belleville, um, they purchased a woman and child in 1812. They, uh, this woman and child, the child's name is not known, but the woman's name was Bet. And this is documented in a bill of sale between Joseph Keeler and William Walbridge. And this gives us a little bit of insight into the experiences of um, black women who were enslaved in the province. As we know, not only were uh, the women enslaved as individuals, but that the children that they bore were, were because of hereditary enslavement, were born into slavery and would also then be of benefit to um, those who held them in, in bondage. It was common for enslaved women in the province uh, to be engaged in domestic work. Enslaved women in service often worked as caregivers to the children of the family and performed a myriad of duties in the homes including washing laundry, sewing, weaving, cooking, cleaning, farming, tending to livestock, and making things like soaps and candles. And so all of this are taking place in the very same spaces that are marked for um, some of these early colonial settlers. Beth's story is interesting, and I've also written a soon to be um, a, a, a chapter in a book soon to be released. Uh, and Beth's story is interesting for a number of reasons, because if you noted that in 1793, there is a bill to gradually abolish slavery, yet we see that in 1812, Beth is um, here being sold and purchased. Um, and then she appears in the historical records again in 1818 in this runaway ad published in the Kingston Gazette. At this time, Bet and her child, um, and we see in this ad, another young child is now um, in the possession of another family, the Levins family. Bet runs away at the end of September in 1818 with an infant child who is about two or three years of age. At this time in tracing her, her um, experience and, and, and through the records, uh, it's estimated that Bet at this time is about 31 years old. So some of the questions that uh, are raised for me in looking at Beth's experiences is, you know, when did she come to, um, to, to be transferred from one family to another? What was her experience like? What precipitated her flight? Where did she go and why? What conditions and treatments did she face um, at that time? This ad ran for three weeks in the Kingston Gazette. 
Um, and so that leads us to understand that she was with her child. But it also shows that in the end of its run in the newspaper, then leads us to believe that she would have been recaptured and, and, and raises questions in terms of what was her life like and the life of her child like afterwards. move on to another example. Um, here are just a few of the markers that recognize the role of the first provincial administrator, Peter Russell. There is a town named after him. And as we see from this sign here, that there are several streets in Toronto, as well as a few streets in Windsor, for example, that are named after him. Yeah, so Russell was the first administrator of the province, as I, I mentioned. And he was a member of the Parliament's Executive Council. And Peter Russell, along with his sister Elizabeth Russell, enslaved a family of four, a woman by the name of Peggy and her children, Jupiter, Amy, and Millie. Peggy's husband and the father of her children was a free man by the name of Pompadour. And Pompadour's story is interesting as well because he, um, was he was free, um, more than likely that he obtained his freedom and service uh, during the American Revo Revolution, yet his family remained in bondage. And again, this speaks to when we talk about hereditary enslavement, that the children remained in bondage as well, because Peggy, their mother, remained in bondage. But uh, Pompadour worked for the Russell family, lived in the same um, area, and he worked for wages. For, um, for the Russells. The Russell estate uh, was then called Russell Abbey, just off of Sherburn Street, uh, south of, of Adelaide. And um, he also had a farm called Petersville. And this was in the Queen Street area and around Beverly and Huron Streets. The family, um, the Russells, siblings, and slave carried out a range of tasks. We learned from an advertisement that Russell published in 1806 that Peggy cooked, she washed laundry, and she made soap and candles, likely with the assistance of her daughters, Amy and Millie. Jupiter, their son, worked as a house servant, but he also did farming chores alongside his father um, at the Petersville farm, where there were cows, there were different kinds of livestock, uh, they hunted deer, they threshed wheat, they harvested the crops, um, and they also worked alongside another free man by the name of Robert Franklin. It's also noted that um, Pompadour, he was known to have uh, assisted in retrieving merchant goods off of the ship uh, when they arrived at Queen's Wharf down, um, down in Toronto as well. We learn a little bit from about Peggy through some of the documentation. Uh, and of note is that Peggy resisted her enslavement. We see here on the left an ad placed in 1803 that Peggy absconded from the Russells without permission. Uh, we also learn that um, because of Peggy's resistance and, and how she pushed back against her enslavement, that Russell tried to, um, to sell Peggy and her son Jupiter um, a few times. For example, Russell tried to get Matthew Elliott, um, an Indian agent who I will mention soon, to broker a sale of Peggy to Joseph Brandt in 1801 and 1802, but that fell through. Numerous documents give us a sense of how, you know, what the lives of this family was under the enslavement of the Russells, uh, ranging from um, punishment, physical punishment, um, Peggy uh, in 1803 and 1804 receiving an allowance, and the son Jupiter uh, receiving an educational instruction for at least three months. And after, um, we see at 18, after 1806, they still appear in the records um, where we see that Pompadour passed away 
and that Peggy and her daughters continue to reside in freedom and it seems to be living afterwards uh, in freedom. And it's in, it wanted to point out that in 2013, a laneway just off of where the Russell estate once was, was named after Pompadour. Some of the physical features, the, the natural landmarks of our province are oft also named after early uh, colonial settlers and are also connected to, um, you know, in the very same spaces where the people that they enslaved lived and worked. Uh, just two examples of that is Gray's Creek in Cornwall, named after Major James Gray. Uh, James Gray and his wife, Elizabeth Lowe, enslaved a family, the mother Dorinda, uh, two sons, John and Simon, and later on Dorinda would go on to have about four more children. Uh, so while Dorinda remained in Cornwall, uh, John and Simon, um, who were passed on to the son Robert once James passed away, they worked as personal servants to Robert Gray in Toronto, when Robert Gray became the Solicitor General of the province. John's story is interesting, uh, and I talk more about it in a talk on February 25th, but he's born into slavery in Quebec at the time and the Loyalists are temporarily located there and then moves to uh, Cornwall. Uh, so he's born and, 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 and raised in, a young, in his young life in enslavement, and then he obtains his freedom in 1803 uh, during an unfortunate incident where Robert Gray, uh, accompanied by his brother Simon, were going to a, a court case um, in Presquil Island, and they were on a ship uh, on Lake Ontario, and the ship sank. And just months prior, Robert Gray had drawn his will uh, and declared that Dorinda, John and Simon and the other children would be freed upon his death. And so this, um, this boating, in, this accident resulted in the death of Robert, the death of his brother Simon, unfortunately, and it also resulted in John receiving his freedom. John would go, um, go on to enlist in the 104th Regiment in New Brunswick. He served, he fought in the War of 1812. And we learn about his story because his, um, there are, was one of two firsthand accounts of the people who were born into slavery here and, and that their stories is documented. So there was an interview um, and, and John shares a little bit of what his life was like in slavery and freedom. And so this is the vicinity where John grew up as a boy, where he did work, where his family, uh, where he was with his family as well before relocating to Toronto. After his military service, he would go on and move back to Cornwall and um, re resided there until he passed away in 1871. Another uh, natural marker more, um, the, the mayor's pair, Marina, the mayor's pair. Um, and there was some conversation, um, this is in Belleville, and this, there was some conversation around this, uh, this naming of this site uh, about, I guess, maybe two years ago. Um, it's named after uh, John Walden Myers, it's seen here in the plaque in Mayor's Creek, which later became Belleville, and as I mentioned, um, Mayor's Pair. Uh, so Mayers was a, a gristmill operator and uh, uh, Mayers and his wife uh, enslaved a woman named Betty. And Betty is noted as having the surname Levi. And her husband apparently was enslaved by another family. Uh, and so uh, in light of um, I guess more public awareness uh, that, uh, the, that the mayors enslaved this woman and potentially her family, that there were calls to have the, um, the pair renamed. And so I, I will also you know, take a look at, uh, again, uh, some of this conversation around what does this mean for the naming and calls for renaming of some of these spaces. <laughs> 
So I get back to Matthew Elliott, who I mentioned earlier, where Peter Russell uh, wanted to use him to uh, broker the sale of Peggy and her son Jupiter to Mohawk Chief Joseph Brandt. Uh, Matthew Elliott himself, um, he settled in Fort Malden, which is now the Amherstburg area. And there is a heritage plaque named after him as well as several streets in Windsor. He received a large waterfront um, land grant as was common for a lot of the senior officers in the military. And Elliot is noted as having enslaved upwards of 50 to 60 black people. And so these would have been the people who cleared the, the land, farmed, the, farmed and helped to build the grand estate that Elliot was noted as having. In uh, the early 1800s, around 1805, 1806, approximately 40 of the Black people that Elliot enslaved stole their freedom, fleeing to Michigan and serving in an all Black militia in Detroit. The following year in 1806 and 1807, Elliot was still adamant about wanting to maintain his possession of those he enslaved. And he tried to use the courts to have at least eight of them extradited back here into Ontario. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, that was uh, unsuccessful. In this vicinity in Essex County, uh, and I just wanted to highlight quickly that there are also a number of markers um, of, uh, of colonial settlers, of white colonial settlers that are named after quite a number of people who um, again um, enslaved uh, black people, such as Babe Street, and um, I'll touch about that family in a bit, Askin Avenue named after John Askin, Labaday Road, uh, and again, Russell Street and Peter Street named after Peter Russell. Were there any questions, um, Christopher, before I continue? Uh, thank you, there were a few. Um, just before I get to a couple of questions though, um, I wanted to point out we've got a lot of people on in the chat saying how excited they are to hear from you again. So oh, thank uh, you. There's, a, there's a lot of positive feedback there. Obviously, I can't go through every comment, but yeah. uh, I wanted to, to summarize those. And uh, just on a personal note, I, I also wanted to say thank you. Um, Tom and I were chatting earlier, we've got a, an awful lot of teachers signed up. So I'm really, I, I'd like to say that thank you to all my teacher colleagues that were able to take some time out this weekend. I know it's a very busy time of year, and a very uh, stressful time of year as well. So thank you to everybody. Um, I mean, education is, is what this is all about. So that's fantastic to have so many teachers here. Thank you. Great. Um, and I just wanted to, um, a personal question, if that's okay, first, um, and then there were a few in the chat. Um, you mentioned a book um, when you were talking about the Bet story, and you mentioned she was going to be a, a chapter um, in a forthcoming book. Is that one you're writing that we can look forward to? Or is that so it's an edited collection, and it's um, I'll get the specific title, but it's it's the great uh, the great white north, and it's a compilation of essays on um, on Black Canadian history, and so that will be forthcoming. Um, it covers a range of of, of stories and, and scholarship of Black Canada. So I will share that when um, and pass that on to Tom. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so one of the questions from the chat was asking about um, where some of these or where a lot of these enslaved peoples were coming from directly. Um, mm -hmm. what, were they mostly coming from the U.S. into um, upper, upper and lower Canada and, of course, um, the maritime provinces as well? Mm -hmm. But was it mostly from the U.S. or was there um, a trade directly from Africa mm -hmm. into Canada as well? Great question. So it there were primarily it was like uh, secondary and tertiary waves into uh, the province. Um, for example, as you mentioned, uh, some with the with the loyalist movement, the relocation loyalists going into the the maritime provinces, and a lot of them bringing in the. Uh, the black people that they enslaved in the United States into Canada, and that included in the Maritimes, in Quebec, and in um, 
and here in Ontario as well. As part of the, as part of that, um, that movement, uh, we see several things there in the maritime provinces. There were, uh, there were numbers of enslaved Africans who were brought in from the Caribbean. Um, and there were a couple of auction uh, notifications, a note auction postings that, that point this out. Uh, there's also, as you said, a large number coming in from the United States. So look, with the, the end of the American Revolution uh, and the agreement between the US and the, um, and the British that those who were promised their freedom would have to, to leave. They couldn't remain in the United States. Um, and then uh, the, the, the black people that were enslaved by loyalists re remained enslaved. That wasn't the concern of, of any of the agreement there. This number was also increased with the, um, the trade in, in, in African people um, that was supported by indigenous warriors. So as part of the raiding uh, during the American Revolution, there are numerous records that point to um, indigenous warriors who were fighting in support of Britain, uh, who kidnapped and brought in uh, African people and sold them to to loyalists here in, 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 in Ontario, for example, and in, in small numbers, uh, we know that Indigenous people also enslaved Black people as well. One of the more recorded, because of his very close relationship and his upbringing, Joseph Brandt, uh, was noted to have enslaved, uh, again, upwards of about 40 or 50 um, Black people in Burlington. And, I, and I'm actually just going to, I'm going to mention him briefly. So there's those who were imported, and then these people would then have children. So there were children such as John Baker, who I mentioned, uh, and several others who were born into slavery right here in Canada. And so there were at least um, a few generations of Black people born into enslavement here in Canada. Thank you. Um, and um, a, a nice segue, I suppose, another question um, from the chat. Somebody was asking, um, have you come across um, enslavement of the First Nations people? Was was that common in this region as well? So in I don't know if that's so, part of your study. Yes, yeah, so in this region, um, it is smaller numbers because by the time you have um, British settlement entering into um, into this province the the demographics of those who were enslaved was changed from indigenous majority to black majority however in the maritimes in quebec uh, from the early introduction of slavery uh in the 1600s and 1700s uh it was uh, the majority were indigenous peoples and uh so it was about two-thirds Indigenous people and uh, and about a third Black people, and then you know at the end of the Seven Years' War and the British taking over in 1760, then again with with Britain because Britain then becomes the largest slave trader, um, we see that demographic change, and so there has been some work um, around. Uh, the, those who were enslaved in, in New France or under French colonialism, which were primarily indigenous people. Fascinating. Um, I, I mean, I, this is, um, from a personal standpoint, so much of this is just um, eye-opening. And, and uh, once again, thank you for, uh, you know, just all your work in bringing this to our attention. I'm just, um, those were the questions I had written down from the chat. So I'm just um, taking it. Um, so I'll just, I have a little bit more to share. I just didn't, in case if there were some, you know, questions, I, I didn't want to carry on too far. Um, and then we can have another opportunity at the end to check in again for some questions. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So as I mentioned, uh, Joseph Brent uh, in my talk uh, so far, uh, I wanted to just point out here the ways um, that I see through through the work that I've done, the ways that the history of enslavement has been excised from public memory. Uh, and, and when we look at some of the colonial memorials and those that remember uh, loyalists, that they have not included the men, women, and children that were enslaved in the very same 
I don't know, buildings, foundations, spaces where these buildings are and these buildings remain today. They are now places uh, of uh, museums. Uh, so here we have Joseph Brandt House, which is now the Joseph Brandt Museum on the top left. And as I just mentioned, Joseph Brandt, um, he enslaved upwards of 40 to 50 uh, people in, in Burlington. One of them was a little girl who was um, named Sophia Pooley. And she herself, as a, as a young girl of about eight years old, was kidnapped by indigenous warriors and was given to or sold to Joseph Brandt, who then took her from Niagara and then into Burlington. And hers, if you recall, I mentioned John Baker as one of two firsthand accounts of someone who was uh, enslaved in, in Canada as a young person. Sophia's Pulleys is the second firsthand account of someone who was enslaved as a young child. And um, we learn about her in 1855 when uh, white abolitionist Benjamin Drew go visits Ontario to speak to freedom seekers in different places. And uh, when he visited the Queen's Bush, which is just north of uh, Waterloo, Kitchener area, uh, he encounters Sophia Pooley. And she talks about her experience of being kidnapped from New York, her and her sister, um, you know, living with Joseph Brandt, how she was mistreated by uh, Joseph Brandt's uh, wife, um, how she was raised with the children. She learned to speak Mohawk. She engaged in a range of tasks, including hunting. Um, and, and so she, again, gives some insight. And so in this very same space here is where Sophia Spooley and, and the, the others uh, were enslaved. Then here we have on the top right corner, Homewood Museum, which is um, or was the original uh, settlement area of Dr. Solomon Jones. And Solomon Jones is noted to have purchased a young girl about nine years old from his brother, Daniel Jones. And her name was Elizabeth and Elizabeth was enslaved in the Joneses household. Uh, and I do wanna say that um, I don't know how long it's been, but the Homewood Museum does um, mention Elizabeth that she was uh, held enslavement there. At the bottom, the two bottom images are from the Windsor area. That's the, um, the Babay House, which is now the Community Museum, the Francois Babay House, and then the Duff Babay House. So these are both homes of Babay brothers. Uh, the father, uh, Jacques Babay, he, he owned, uh, he enslaved about 18 Black and Indigenous people in Detroit. And when Detroit was turned over um, to uh, the Americans in 1796 uh, as a result of Jage's Treaty and the Loyalists relocated onto the Canadian side, um, the, the sons inherited some of the, the people that, um, that were enslaved by their family. And so these places have only, some of them have only recently, due to the efforts of um, research uh, and, and um, interest by, at least for, from my knowledge, as several Black scholars have begun to acknowledge that um, they're connected to enslavement in some small ways. Here I also want to mention the connection to the, the, the early colonial government and the structuring of the colony and state and how that is also uh, um, the, the history of enslavement is, is in very much a part of that, but we have not understood that as much. Here is a picture that I took um, in Queen's Park. And so while, although Queen's Park is not the original site of the first parliament, it's further east um, in Toronto, this is a, a picture a li that lists members of the first legislative assembly. And so because of the research that I do, when I, you know, when I had entered Queen's Park, that when I saw this sign, it just, it, it stood out to me for, you know, because of the focus of, of my research. So when we look at early, uh, looking at the early colony and the state formation of Ontario, that uh, the practice, the institution of enslavement is part of that. 
the politicians, members of the Legislative Assembly, the Legislative Council, the Executive Council, so all levels of provincial government. These politicians are remembered as founders and for the ideals that are recognized as foundational to the beginnings of Ontario such as loyalism and reform. But then what about ideals of race and racism and enslavement? And, you know, how much is this uh, taken up? Uh, connections to legislation around the history of enslavement are also, also require a rereading of our um, colonial past. Uh, for example, I mentioned when the British were victorious over the French in the Seven Years' War. And with the Articles of Capitulation in 1760 in Montreal, um, one of the clauses, the 47th Article, stipulated and confirmed that slavery existed and said that those Indigenous and Black people who were enslaved at the time of the turnover would remain in that condition, that nothing would change. And then in 1790, um, there was an Imperial Act passed by the, um, by the British Parliament that to encourage the, uh, the settlement and immigration of white settlers into different colonies, including here in Canada. And in one of the clauses stated that they would allow um, white settlers into these colonies to import the Black people that they enslaved duty-free for one year. And that included furniture, husbandry, tools, utensils. And so we see within that, that grouping, that categorization, we see that um, enslaved people as chattel property was very much part of their consideration and their usefulness was part of the consideration of the growth and the development of the colony. Then in 1793, we have the, it's the long title here, an act to prevent the further introduction of slaves and to limit the terms of contract for servitude, what is now called, um, we called it the 793, 1793 Act to Limit Slavery. And if you recall, I mentioned it earlier because uh, Peter Martin informed the Executive Council what happened to Chloe Cooley when Adam Vrooman um, bound her and, uh, and put her in a boat and put her, sold her across the Ni Niagara River into, this, into New York. Because at that time, there were whispers that Simcoe was going to abolish slavery. And so Adam Vrooman and other uh, slaveholders, what they were doing was to try to, it, to try to avoid any financial losses was that they were selling the Black people that they enslaved into the United States. So as I mentioned as well, John White, the Attorney General and Simcoe, they put forth um, a bill to abolish enslavement. However, it, well, they were not successful. Um, and what wound up happening was this bill to gradually abolish slavery over the course of about three generations. Simcoe is noted to have said that the bill received much opposition, but little argument from politicians who themselves majority were slaveholders. At least 12 members, of the 25 person government, the first parliament here that I listed here, owned slaves or were members of slaveholding families. What the 1793 legislation did, the very first thing it did, the very first clause confirmed that slavery was an institution and that this legislation upheld it. It said that nothing herein contained shall extend or be construed to extend to liberate any Negro or other person subjected to such service as aforesaid or to discharge them in any of them from the possession of the owner thereof, from their themselves or from their families 
Um, and this talks about, you know, obviously the inheritance of those who were enslaved. And so this is important because oftentimes this legislation is, is celebrated as part of our, right, as part of our political history as being the first anti-slavery legislation, um, you know, in the in British colonies, in the British Empire. And so again, it's important to note that the very first thing this did is to confirm and to uh, reaffirm uh, the slaveholding in our province. I also want to broaden the history of um, enslavement here in Ontario to the broader context of um, the transatlantic slave trade, Atlantic slavery, um, the, the enslavement of Black people, and connect it to, um, to the British Empire. Here is a quote from communications between Simcoe Hare to Henry Dundas in 17, uh, September 1793. So this is just about two months after the 1793 bill passes. And so Simcoe notes to Henry Dundas that the greatest resistance was to the slave bill. Many plausible arguments of the dareness of labor and the difficulty of obtaining servants to cultivate lands were brought forward. So we notice here that we see the distinction between the slave bill referring to black people who were held as chattel right, held as property and, and distinguishing them between servants, referring to white servants, people who were contractual laborers and would have received wages for their pay. And so this was the position of the early politicians of, um, you know, of the province. And so this is important to note. And I wanna point out here too, the connection to Henry Dundas, because I think we are all well aware of the conversation of the naming of Dundas Street and the town of Dundas, named after this very same Henry Dundas, who was uh, pro-slavery and um, himself a slave owner. And so the city of Toronto is now in the process of evaluating what to do with the naming of these streets um, and uh, after, um, after Henry Dundas. I also want to hear talk about um, when we, you know, when I, I'm trying to, to stress here how uh, the want of enslaved labor, the, the use of enslaved labor was ingrained in legislation and upheld and supported by the politicians of the province that in 1798, uh, legislative member Christopher Robbins, Robinson introduced a bill that would reverse the 1793 bill, so revoking the, um, the gradual abolition of slavery because he wanted to attract more white settlers into the province and encourage them to bring in um, the, the people that they enslaved in order to help grow their personal wealth, uh, yes, but also to help in the development of the colony. Again, we see from this quote here, talking about the need for that they wanted um, affordable free labor to, um, to, to draw on. It's important to note that this bill passed the first three readings, votes of eight to four, and that the reason why it did not go through was that there were a few members of the executive council one of them being Robert Gray, who I mentioned earlier and had enslaved um, John Baker and, and his brother, his family, uh, that they tied it up in, and, and it, then the session, the parliament session ended and it was not reintroduced the following fall because uh, Christopher Robinson passed away. I mentioned this because it's important again to understand the attitudes and the, the beliefs that undergirded that push for the continuance of the enslavement of African people. And again, this, these ideas and, and these views have been minimized or erased from the, the memory of the beginnings of this province. I share a quote here from Greg Marquise, who wrote about the about loyalist history and the loyalist historical tradition and how that's been taken up. And he notes that these political refugees, the loyalists, including men and women, but apparently no slaves, laid the foundation of a happy and prosperous society. 
And so he talks about the creation and the celebration of a somewhat sanitized past, the, the, the loyalist beginnings that has removed the practice of enslavement from the narrative and cloaks the reality of slavery and how this, um, and he talks briefly about, and I talk about it more in my research, how this actively contributes to the disremembering of the black men, women, and children who were enslaved. And so in these few stories that I share, I take a moment to assess, you know, that absence and the presence um, juxtaposed by the presence of enslaved Africans. Uh, and I want, this has been uh, a point of conversation over the past summer, and I wanted to point out a few guerrilla signs that appeared um, in Toronto uh, last August. So there were three signs that an anonymous person put up in three different locations. And you will see that the signs um, name uh, Jarvis, um, the previous one I showed Russell and Hare Babe and um, talk about uh, though these um, individuals as noted political elite and founders of the province, uh, English founders uh, and point to their, their slave holding. And so these signs, we read these signs as interventions into the colon colonized rendering of the landscape and interjecting and overlaying the historical realities of enslavement. The signs revise these sanitized narratives to acknowledge the 260 year history of enslavement here in, Tor in Toronto, in Ontario and in Canada. And it's an intentional intervention. Um, and we see that with the information that they provide. These temporary plaques raise critical questions about the intersections of race, colonization, landscape, and public spaces. They also prompt us to reconsider who is memorialized and who has been excised from our shared past, historical events are remembered, are forgotten, erased, and the processes that lead to this um, these determinations. These signs also prompt important questions, such as why the lack of public awareness that Black and Indigenous people were enslaved by white colonial settlers, and when will those held in perpetual captivity be publicly recognized with a memorial? In my research, I contend that there has been a silencing of the slave past in the construction of celebrations of the pioneering um, beginnings of Ontario and that the practice of enslavement have been effectively removed from the loyalist narrative and subsequently the public historical consciousness. In the biographies, plaques and other information that memorializes white colonial settlers who enslave black and indigenous people, um, these stories and these monuments access the very same colonial archives that I did, but do not acknowledge their slaveholding. These facts have been selectively filtered out and this practice must be situated in the broader Canadian tactic of denial and the declaration of the self-declaration of absolution from our own history of enslavement. We're often comfortable with pointing to, you know, the United States history of enslavement or saying that, well, technically uh, Canada didn't exist until 1867. And so there was no slavery in Canada, trying to divorce the colonial beginnings of, um, of the province and of the nation. From the very same colonial archives, I have been able to retrieve, exhume fragments of the enslaved. The archives where the enslaved were documented as chattel, family holdings, recorded um, records that were created by enslavers for enslavers. Uh, and oftentimes, it, you know, this is around demeaning views of the people that they were, that they enslaved because they were viewed as property. And so this, the archives have contributed to this erasure. This common practice that is woven into public pedagogy has had implications for retrieving and acknowledging our safe past as I have shown and has led to the disassociation from this historical reality. Some would prefer that the harsh truth of the history of enslavement in Canada not be investigated and can be unsettling 
to them because of its found because um, is to have foundational, especially laudatory views disrupted. Um, my research contests the spatial interpretation of colonial Ontario, provides new revelations, and centers those who were enslaved as historical actors. These unfamiliar stories are part of our history and helps us to better understand our historical beginnings. They also call on us to recognize the significance of the Canadian iteration of enslavement. And so th this means we need to move away from saying, well, the numbers were small, we didn't have plantations and therefore, you know, it didn't matter. Uh, what my research notes is that it doesn't matter the number, it's one too many, the fact that they were enslaved and that we need to honor and, and remember who these people were. These enslaved people lived and died in these spaces, they labored in these spaces, they traversed these lands, had children, spouses, they existed in these spaces. Yet these human beings are not part of our collective remembering. So two aims of my research, uh, which is called One Too Many, is to create a slavery database and to spur the creation of sites of memory to the enslaved to honor their presence and their humanity. The responses to my talks over the past few months and the temporary signs as well demonstrate that there is an interest in reckoning with our history of enslavement and in keeping the conversation alive through permanent markers. And so it would be great to see that there are markers in these same very spaces um, that help to again to present a more critical presentation of our history. And so I close there. Um, I hope you do find you found my talk to be informative uh, and um, that you know you will continue to learn more. And I wanted to open up now for some of the questions that um, that you may have. Thank you. Um, just going based on some of the comments again um, that have been flooding in the last few minutes. Um, people uh, really enjoyed your talk. So thank you again. Um, We've got lots of questions. I'm going to do my best to kind of group them a little bit so that hopefully we can get to as many as we can. Um, there were a few questions um, sort of centered around your your sources. Um, and I, I get the impression that people want to um, sort of explore these archives that you've been talking about. And so um, one of them was just a generally, could you talk about some of the archives that you've been using? And then one of them um, specifically referred to Joseph Grant, Joseph Brandt, excuse me. Um, so where you were uh, finding a lot of information okay. on him. So one of the interesting things, and I just very briefly mentioned, um, you know, colonial archives and how the structuring of the archives has um, positioned enslaved people in the archives as property, but then also because the archives uh, support the the preservation of the the origins of the right the colonial origins that there are particular um, records that are documented and that whole taxonomy of you know what's documented what's noted and how these things that process plays out um, implicitly hides the, the, that history of enslavement. And so the documentation and the records related to those who were enslaved are desperate, they're spread out. Um, there isn't an archives that I'm aware of and not, that I've come across here in Ontario that has a specific uh, font collection uh, labeled and identified as the history of slavery in Ontario or the province. It, it's um, scattered, these documents are scattered in the records of some of these political and social elites and, um, and colonial founders of the province. Uh, so some of those um, uh, records in the archives of Ontario, um, the Toronto, the, the archives in Toronto, um, uh, oh my God, the reference library. How could I forget the Toronto reference library? Some of these records, you will find them. Um, the, the newspaper ads, as you can see here on this screen, newspapers have a wealth of information, church records. And so, you know, it, it, it's taken some time to identify these fragments as I call them. And, and so one of the important tasks that I'm undertaking is to pull all of these together into a database so that they actually 
it creates us an archive of enslavement again to address um, that gap that, uh, from, from other archives. And so there's um, military records, church records, Joseph Brandt because of his relationship um, and his upbringing he is more noted in military records as a as an indigenous person who um, who held black slaves, and so we see that there again. I mentioned the first hand account, for example, of Sophia Puli, who, from her words, uh, talks about her experience being enslaved by Joseph Brandt and his wife. Um, so there are a range of of documents that I've. Um, that I've tapped into looking at some secondary sources. So some of the, the books, the texts that document loyalist history make very brief mention of some of those who were enslaved and has provided uh, some great uh, leads into further pursuing uh, some of these people and pursuing further documents. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I Personally, I'm really looking forward to um, I'm sure it's it's a huge undertaking, but this database, um, and then uh, already we're seeing all the connections right um, through this multi-layered history, and I'm I'm just really looking forward to this database and how we can connect um, sort of all these people in the database with all um, the other history that we're sort of studying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's going to be a fascinating database. I can't wait to see it. Thanks, Christopher. Um, a simple one, I hope, um, turning to sort of the 1793 region. Um, do we know, um, did Governor Simcoe is seen as a um, an abolitionist in our sort of traditional history, right? Our, um, our the traditional way we've been taught history in Ontario. Did he, um, do we know if he um, owned enslaved people? I, I have not come across that in my research nor in, in looking at other research of, of people uh, on, on him. Um, what is known uh, is that he did have um, expressed abolitionist leanings. After he left uh, Upper Canada, he was appointed to um, to Haiti, what is now Haiti. And part of his, his role was to support the reinstitution of in the enslavement of Haitian people. Um, and so he held that post for a few years until he retired. And so I haven't done any research in terms of whether what he expressed um, personally regarding enslavement here in, um, in Ontario. Um, and then when he retired, uh, but there, I, I found some tidbits in terms of what I shared here with his communication with Henry Dundas. And when he highlights that there was some opposition of politicians to the 1793 Act. Uh, but it, it's, you know, again, that positioning, this very kind of stark positioning of anti slavery, um, that Simcoe being an, an anti-slavery um, person or that this legislation was uh, was anti-slavery, it really simplifies it because again, when we point to the first clause, the first very first thing it does is that it confirms enslavement. And so uh, it, it really calls on us to really understand that the, the colony of what is what we now call Ontario was part of the broader empire, British empire where enslavement was a core practice. Um, and, and we're not absolved from that. And so I think that that needs to be, you know, a different a, a rereading of that, of that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I think that gets to the heart of exactly what we've been trying to do for years is literally absolve ourselves and sort of um, like you sort of said earlier um, especially in, in consider comparing ourselves to the united states or even in ontario consider comparing ourselves to other parts of canada and saying but we're different mm -hmm. and, it, and we, we don't really deserve that ab abolition yeah um, so um another question sort of um on the same theme um so you you did mention the 1793 bill that um the first clause uh very clearly uh said slavery is still an institution um in upper canada um but there was a question about what else it said what what was the goal of the 1793 um okay 
Sure, I can absolutely, I can give a synthesis of it. And I have uh, a Canadian encyclopedia article that's called Chloe Cooley and the 1793 Act to Limit Slavery that um, talks about it. And so the, the, the following clauses then outline what, what gradual abolition would entail. And it says that the children, people who were held enslaved in 1793 remained enslaved. The children born um, once the law took effect would remain enslaved until the age of 25. And then when those children had children, their children would be born free. And so that would take you really into the early 1800s where some of these people would be freed if, uh, and they would could be freed earlier if they were manumitted by those who enslaved them, but failing that legally, they could be held until those times. Um, and there is documentation of few, of few people we see, for example, with Bet, who was sold in 1812 and then sold again prior to 1818. Um, there is a record of a, a young boy by the name of Tom, who I hypothesize is um, could likely be one of Beth's sons. In 1824, he is 15 years old and his remaining 10 years, so he was born after 1793 and could be enslaved until the age of 25. So he, his remaining 10 years is sold from one person to the next. And then he would have been freed technically in 1834. And we know that August 1st, 1834 is when um, British Parliament abolished slavery in most of its colonies. Um, and so Tom would have been um, at least one of the few who would have likely been held enslaved until you know, the very end. Um, and so that's important to know. This also, this bill also says that um, those who enslaved black people had to provide for them so that they would not become charges on the towns where they resided. And so they had to provide some food, um, clothing. Um, they could encourage them to hire them as indentured servants and to have limited contracts, again, to transition from exploited free labor to indentured labor. Um, and so these are just some of the things that this legislation covers. Thank you. Um so I'm going to apologize to some of the other people on the chat. Um, there are some other questions there that I think could almost be entire talks on themselves. Um, sort of um, some questions uh, asking about um, the comparison between enslaved peoples and free blacks um, mm -hmm. in this region and uh, or questions about sort of how do we change the narrative going forward and just massive questions and, I, and i'm sorry to say i think we uh, we have to uh draw the line in the sand somewhere so i well, apologize I could say one thing quickly just to point out with pompadour and peggy for example that it is important to know that there were enslaved people and free people in the same families like peter martin and his children pompadour and his family in and in the same vicinity as well um, who worked and lived together in those same spaces. And so the statuses of black people at that time were, were different. And we see what that meant to be enslaved and to be held as chattel versus to be free and to be able to get land and to work for wages and whatnot. But um, it's, it's uh, again, it's important to note the complexities of those experiences. Absolutely. Well, uh, I would like to say thank you uh, um, for all all the questions, all the answers. Uh, but at this, this point, I'm going to turn it back to Tom, who's going to do a thank you as well. Yeah, very much, Natasha. That, that was outstanding. Uh, it, it's amazing. You know, so many familiar names uh, associated with, with early Upper Canada, the, the War of 1812. And it's, it, it's wonderful to have a, a more complete part of the story. And, and uh, looking at the comments, people thoroughly enjoyed this. So just a, a wonderful job. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us. And I hope you can join us for some of our future talks. So everyone take care. Thank you so much. Thank